Hi friends, welcome. It is a few days after the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, and I wanted to make a video about that day and how that day was documented. But I also realized that many of you guys who are watching may not have a memory of that day because perhaps you're too young, or maybe your memory of that day is very different than mine because you're not from America. A lot of my viewers are not from America. As for me, I am quite American, and I'm also just old enough to have a memory of that day. And I remember I was in my living room, we were watching on TV what was going on. What, what I take away, the feeling I take away, the, the, the singular experience that I take away most distinctly from that day is the feeling of not wanting the towers, probably just the second tower, because I think the first tower, when it fell, I think that was unprecedented. It was a new thing. Uh, I, I may have been thinking, I hope it doesn't fall, but I'm, I'm thinking I was probably just thinking about the second tower. That feeling of not wanting it to fall so bad. <laughs> and then when the when it fell, I remember just the emptiness of that moment, um, the, the it's all overness of it. It was a very sad day, obviously. I've always been fascinated by the look of the photos and footage from that day. Uh, the a lot of it was shot on film. Some of it was shot on you know little probably mini DV tapes, and it has such a nostalgic and um, emotional tone for me. Another thing is that the circumstances for documentation were were very special that day, and what I mean by that is there were many people, there were many cameras, and it was an event that unfolded slowly in punctuated moments. This allowed it to be documented from a lot of different angles, so what we get is stuff from up close, stuff from far away, stuff from helicopters. I want to talk about a, uh, a photo story, it's a very beautifully laid out web page experience made by the Wall Street Journal. And in a photo story with beautiful full screen photos, it gives a timeline of the events. So perhaps if you're somebody who actually doesn't understand what all happened that day, this is a great way to very easily gain a better understanding. But there's one photo that I wanted to talk about specifically from this photo story, and you can find it kind of right in the middle. It's speaking about the South Tower collapsing. And this photo is by a guy named Thomas Nilsson, and it's one of the, the most um, intense photos that I've seen from that day. It's a very clear, detailed photo of the top of the tower collapsing in on the rest of the building. And you can see, of course, the, the cloud coming out of the building, the debris all around. But if you look at the top of the building, it looks like it's actually bending. But this photo so powerfully communicates the the enormity and the, the energy of that moment of the building falling. Next, I want to talk about some photos from James Noctway. And this first photo, I actually made an Instagram post about because you guys may or may not remember in a previous photo walk video in New York City, I found the spot where this photo was taken and attempted to recreate the positioning as, as best as I could. But of course, this photo is pretty incredible, and to think that he was—he happened to be standing in that spot when the tower came down, and he was able to juxtapose the cross with the tower, and and also get an American flag up in the top right corner. Uh, just just a very very strong photo, very thoughtful photo. Then we have this one after uh, maybe one or two of the towers fell of firefighters scrambling, and one of the things that strikes me about that day is how um, all over the place everything became as soon as the first tower fell. It seemed like there was just pandemonium, even particularly with the, with the first responders. Normally when you see firefighters running around, they know exactly what they're doing, but there was this sense that 
everybody had lost their script. And this photo communicates that well. You can see that they're still problem solving in the midst of this war zone. And here's another photo that communicates a similar idea. We have a group of three firefighters next to a crushed truck uh, shooting water into a building that's no longer a full building. It feels almost silly that they're shooting water into a window in this very overwhelming situation, but they're still, they're still problem solving. They still have a job to do. Then we have this one with a group of people carrying this guy who is seemingly unconscious through this gray, ashy landscape. Once again, it looks like an absolute disaster zone, which is what it was. And um, very beautiful light, beautiful light on the guy's face, uh, the guy who's unconscious, draws our eye into him. I wanted to mention this photo by photographer Bill Biggert because as far as I know, this is his last known photo. Uh, right after the South Tower fell, he took this photo, and then the North Tower fell, and he died. So um, you can go on his website, and this is the last photo on his website. This is a great example of how photojournalists work. They will run towards the thing that everybody else is running away from because they want to document it. And um, I, I want to thank Bill for his photos. You can go on his website and, and see more of them. This is another one by photographer Kelly Gunther, and this is the plane heading into the South Tower. And you can see how beautifully positioned the plane is between um, buildings. There's this little slot cut out for it and it's perfectly centered in the frame. This photo is very powerful obviously because we know exactly where that plane is heading and th these are the last moments for that plane for everybody inside that plane. But it's also made stronger by how aesthetically beautiful and thoughtful the photo is. Like I said we have the plane perfectly centered in the frame and in between a, a set of buildings. We have the city skyline beautifully framed and a lot of sky which allows you to see that smoke rising up. And then the, the film look on this, the film grain um, kind of touches on that aesthetic that I was speaking to earlier. It makes this photo very powerful for me. Oh, and of course the light. We have this photo by Ruth Frimson of a police officer in uh, some sort of restaurant with a water bottle in his hand resting. And I think this communicates how overwhelming that day was for all of the first responders very well. Okay, now I wanted to talk about my relationship with a lot of the videos from 9-11. I've been watching these videos since I was very young. Uh, a lot of times I'll, it'll circle back around to that time of year and I'll go hunting on YouTube for um, a lot of raw footage, a lot of handheld footage. And a lot of these videos that I would prefer to watch are raw, uncut, or barely cut, minimal editing, no no music added, things like that. I mean, I'm all for, you know, a, a beautifully crafted edit, but, but I love just simply experiencing whatever that person and that camera captured. And one of the most iconic videos for me is, is one of the most iconic videos of that day, and it is... I believe the only footage we have of the North Tower being hit by the plane. Editing James here. I want to revise that statement a little bit. I've learned that there are other angles of the North Tower being hit, but that this might be the most clear and high quality. For example, we have one angle where it's just pointing at somebody's feet and you can hear the plane going in and then they pick up the camera. There's another angle that's uh, like a surveillance camera from pretty far away with a very low frame rate. There's another one from a car on the road, uh, not very clear and, and pretty obstructed. So this one is the least of all those things. It's definitely the clearest and most high quality that I've seen so far. Like I said, might. Um, I always want to leave the door open, but I just wanted to revise that. Carry on. We had some firefighters standing around. They were doing some sort of job and uh, I believe probably a news videographer or, or something. And they heard the plane go over the firefighters look up and then the camera pans over towards the tower just in time to see the plane going into it. Now I actually a few days ago went on Google Earth and looked around and found the exact spot where the camera guy was most likely standing when this happened. And um, I do things like that. <laughs> So that's a pretty incredible video. Then there's a compilation on the more edited side that um, once again 
communicates the timeline of that day with beautiful storytelling. So we had the Wall Street Journal, uh, I don't want to call it article, photo story that did that on the photo side. Now we have this being done on the video side. There's another video that I came across recently by a guy named Duncan Skiles, who just happened to be there in New York City when this happened. I'm not sure if he lived there or still lives there, but he just filmed his experience of that day. He was actually quite far from the towers, but he filmed a lot of faces, a lot of uh, people reacting to whatever was happening. And uh, he also has a video from the day after and kind of the somber mood of everything. But uh, that was pretty incredible. And then another insane video is uh, a reporter who had just started his, like, you know, three, two, one, uh, you know, he just started that when the South Tower started falling and they were very close and you could see all the firefighters and them standing around. Everything seemed pretty, you know, I mean, it was an emergency situation, but nobody was panicking. Uh, and then you see the tower coming down on them. And that was when everything changed. Was, this was an unprecedented moment. And then we realized the, the situation has gone from really terrible to extremely terrible. Now, for a long time now, I would circle back around to this video from a guy who I now know his name is Mark Lagenga, I think. And he worked for a news station. And it was this long, barely cut, maybe uncut, I think it had some cuts in it, video of him walking around the disaster zone. But I went back looking for it and I could not find the, f the full thing. I found a really short 60 minutes piece, highly edited, and then I found another one that was less edited, more close to what I remember. But I'm not sure I found the full one yet. And if you know what I'm talking about and you know where that's at, please let me know. Uh, because that was something that I have a lot of memory with. I was very moved by this, this video, him just walking around capturing everything that was going on. And then finally, to put an etc. on the end of all this, there is a channel that I just found called Enhanced WTC Videos. And um, it's full of raw footage from that day. But anyway, to wrap all of this up, this documentation is so important. We would have such a fundamentally different relationship with 9-11 if this, these photos and this footage, etc., was not around. For example, and this is a little bit different, but I think it'll demonstrate my idea. When we hear about Krakatawa going off in 1883, we think, oh, that's that was probably really bad. That was sad, but we don't experience it in the same way. It was a far larger disaster in terms of loss of life. It killed 36,000 people, but it's not baked into our minds in the same way that 9-11 is. And I think that has a lot to do with documentation. These photos and videos are emotional to us and even uncomfortable for us. And when that happens, we tend to be more likely to integrate those things into us and change the way we think about things and the way we do things. And it helps us remember. It helps us to never forget. We don't have to worry about those who lost family members never forgetting. But as for the rest of us and going on into further generations, these photos and videos are very useful tools to help us all never forget. Okay, that is it. Thank you so much for watching. I would love to hear your thoughts. Love you guys. Have a good day.